Throughout this last chapter of our lecture series, we keep on having these analogies. Group theory is to semi-lattice theory, as lattice theory is to ring theory, as rings with unity is to bounded lattices, and finally as fields are to Boolean algebras. Uh, Boolean algebras are the most highly structured objects in the lattice setting, uh, and they are kind of like fields when you make that nice comparison. Um, now. Another thing we studied uh, when we studied ring theory is the idea of a unique factorization. Um, so it sort of begs the question, do lattices or Boolean algebras have unique factorization? Well, if a Boolean algebra is quote unquote atomic, uh, then it does in fact have unique factorization. That's what we wanna do right here and use that actually to characterize all atomic Boolean algebras up to isomorphism. Um, in particular, since every finite Boolean algebra will be atomic, uh, this will classify all finite Boolean algebras up to isomorphism. So what is an atom, right? For a Boolean algebra to be atomic, what is an atom? Uh, so let B be a Boolean algebra. Uh, we say an element A inside the Boolean algebra is an atom if for every element x in the Boolean algebra, if x happens to be less than or equal to the atom, it's either because x is the atom itself or x is equal to zero, the minimum element of the, of the Boolean algebra. So atoms are exactly the minimum non-zero elements of a Boolean algebra, or equivalently an atom, uh, an A, that is an atom so that whenever you have the statement A, x join y equals a, it implies that either x was equal to a or x is equal to zero. So atoms in a Boolean algebra are kind of like irreducible elements. Um, that is, any factorization that results in giving you an atom, either you took the atom itself or you took a unit Right? I mean, this is the uh, zero is, of course, the identity with respect to join. So atoms, just to be clear, atoms are the irreducible elements, so to speak, for the join operation. This is not with regard to meet. We're factoring things uniquely using joins. That's what our goal is going to be. Now, much like in ring theory, you don't necessarily expect uh, irreducibles to always exist. Uh, certainly, uh, there are settings for which we can guarantee they exist, like a unique factorization domain. You always have irreducibles. Um, and in fact, irreducibles and prime numbers are exactly the same thing. You know, if you have an Ethereum ring, you can guarantee they exist. There, there are sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. The same can also happen amongst lattices, even among Boolean algebras. You don't always have atoms. Um, if atoms basically always exist, we can say that the Boolean algebra is atomic. Um, in particular, a Boolean algebra is atomic if for all elements inside of your Boolean algebra, there exists some atom A that lives inside the Boolean, the Boolean algebra. It's an atom. Um, such that a is less than or equal to x. So if, uh, and I guess we should specify here that x is not zero. Um, there's, there's no atoms below the zero element because it's the minimal element. But if you take a non-zero element, um, a Boolean algebra is atomic if it has an atom that is less than it. Uh, again, there's, there's analogies to how we did unique factorization on rings. That's the same idea there. So um, first of all, all finite Boolean algebras are going to be atomic. They have atoms. Because uh, basically, since your, since your uh, Boolean algebra is finite, you have that minimal element, which is zero. Um, then we're going to take the set of all elements that are basically one step above zero. Uh, there's nothing between uh, zero and that element. Since the set's finite, if you look at the order, um, you can't have an infinite descent. So eventually, if you're descending down any element, you're eventually going to have to put a place that is right before zero and you get an atom for finite uh, finite algebras, finite Boolean algebras in that situation. Now, of course, if you, there, 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 do, there do exist um, infinite atomic Boolean algebras. Um, the best example, of course, is going to be the power set of a set, uh, for which if X is an infinite set, right, that means its power set will likewise be infinite. Interesting enough, its cardinality will be properly larger than uh, the set X, but uh, I digress in that situation. Um, if we have an infinite set X, its power set will be an infinite set as well. And in that situation, the singletons, I can very easily describe them, the singletons are going to be the atoms of that Boolean algebra. And therefore, a power set 
algebra is always going to be an atomic Boolean algebra. There do exist, of course, infinite non-atomic Boolean algebras, uh, although that takes us beyond where I want to go in this lecture. It's going to go beyond the scope of our, of our course. We are essentially at the end, our very last lecture here. So instead, what I want to do is uh, prove, you know, classify what a Boolean atomic algebra looks like. And so that's what our theorem is going to do that. Now, this theorem is going to be stated in terms of finite Boolean algebras. And that's mostly just because that's how the statement is phrased in the book. But honestly, I could erase the word finite and I could just say an atomic Boolean algebra and then let X be the set of atoms. Um, and then we're going to then argue that B is isomorphic to the power set of X as a Boolean algebra. And in particular, the order of any atomic Boolean algebra is necessarily going to be two to the cardinality of X. And that's because that's the cardinality of this thing right here. Uh, so the last statement is a very quick corollary. We want to prove that these things are isomorphic. Now, what does it mean for uh, Boolean algebras to be isomorphic? What does it mean for lattices to be isomorphic? What does it mean for semi-lattices to be isomorphic? We've never talked about those things. Uh, now, the notion of a homomorphism, I hope by this point in the lecture series, is much straightforward. Um, we want to map between, like if you want a homomorphism between semi-lattices, you want to map between two semi-lattices so that the binary operation is preserved. In a lattice, uh, we want to prove that, you know, an isomorph a homomorphism between lattices, that it's a map which preserves the two operations of meet and join. Uh, if you're looking at a homomorphism between Boolean algebras, we need to preserve the two binary operations of meet and join, but we also need that complements map to complements. So phi of x prime is equal to phi of x prime. And I will leave it as an exercise for the viewer here to prove that if you have a homomorphism that preserves meet and joins, then it necessarily makes the map an increasing map. That is, it preserves the order of the partially ordered set. And then as a consequence, it'll preserve complements as well. So if, if we have a homomorphism between Boolean algebras that preserves the meet and join operations, then it'll automatically cover complements as well. So I don't need to cover that one. I just need to come up with a uh, well, for an isomorphism, that's going to be a bijective homomorphism, of course. And so what we need to do is prove there exists a bijective join and meet preserving map between this Boolean algebra and that Boolean algebra. And then the two will be isomorphic. And so with regard to the theory of Boolean algebras, those two objects are one and the same thing. There's no reason to distinguish between them. Now, the, the, the proof is going to be based upon the following. We are going to prove that in an atomic Boolean algebra, every element has a unique factorization, the so-called atomic factorization. This is analogous to a prime factorization in a unique factorization domain. Um, this factorization, of course, will be unique up to reordering. Um, because every element is idempotent, we don't have to worry about repeated um, atoms because repeats make no make no difference when your operations are idempotent. And we also don't have to worry about associates in this situation because uh, there are no units in a Boolean algebra. Uh, the, 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 the algebraic structure doesn't work that way. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to prove that every element in an atomic Boolean algebra has a unique atomic factorization. So suppose that X is some generic element of the Boolean algebra and suppose it has something, something less than it. Uh, which of course it could be that a could be itself, it could be zero. Most likely a is going to be an atom, because uh, after all, since this is an atomic Boolean algebra, every element has an atom less than or equal to it, other than zero. But for this next statement, a doesn't have to be an atom. This is true for any situation where a is less than or equal to x. Uh, so x, of course, is equal to x meet one, because one is the identity of meet. Um, by the complement axiom, one is equal to a join a complement, uh, for which then we can distribute x across the join right there. So we get that x meet a join x meet a prime is equal to that as well. Um, for which, because a is less than or equal to x, by definition, that means that x join a is equal to a. So remember that this symbol right here means that a join x is equal to x, and it means that a meet x is equal to a. So when we take x meet a right here, that's equal to a. 
And so we then have the following statement. Uh, now, I claim that Boolean algebras are essentially the same thing as just power sets with unions and intersections. So I want you to think about what this statement we were saying if we were in the set theoretic setting. So let's say that we have some set X. I'm claiming that if A is a subset of X, then we can actually decompose X as A union X take away A. Like so, so you have, so A, excuse me, the set X can be decomposed but to, into a subset and to its set complement. Uh, that observation, that decomposition works for any element inside of a Boolean algebra. If you have X and something less than it, you can decompose X into the A part and the not A part. That's all that thing is saying, okay? Uh, so next, I want us to suppose we have two distinct atoms. Um, that belong to an element X. Now, clearly, because they're two distinct atoms, there. if we take A meet B, that has to equal zero, right? When it comes to an atom, uh, what's going to happen here is that if A, you know, A meet B, you want something smaller than A and smaller than B, which the only thing smaller than A is A and B. The only thing smaller than, excuse me, the only thing smaller than A is A and zero. The only thing smaller than B is B and zero. And so then the greatest lower bound has to be zero. Um, so the intersection of atoms is always equal to zero. All right, so next what I wanna do is make the following observation. If you take your atom B, or again, we are assuming B is an atom in this situation, this, uh, this exercise is going to be very similar to the one we just did here. Uh, well, B is equal to B meet 1, uh, for which by complements, 1 is A join A complement. Then we can distribute B. Like I said, this is very similar. You're going to get B meet A join B meet A complement. And as we observed a moment ago, um, A meet B is equal to 0. We get 0, and adding 0, or excuse me, joining 0 to anything doesn't change anything. So we end up with B equaling a meet a prime. And so from that statement, we can then make the inference about uh, the inequality here. B is less than or equal to a prime, right? So in particular, uh, B is also less than or equal to B intersect a prime, because uh, B is less than or equal to B, and B, as we just observed, is less than or equal to a prime. And so B will be less than or equal to their greatest lower bound, which would be B, inter, uh, B intersect A prime in that situation. All right, so now we're gonna get to the heart of our observation about um, atomic decomposition. So we have these two atoms, A and B. So by the very first statement that we proved in this, in this proof here, right? Uh, so just as a reminder, what we said here is that, whoops, if A is less than or equal to X, then we can decompose X as A union the complement. So X meet a complement, like so. Okay, and so honestly, in Boolean algebra, sometimes people introduce the notation that X minus A, by definition, is X meet a complement, much like we do in set theory. Although in set theory, you use, often use this more of slant minus sign. Uh, that's a fine, that's fine. You can use that if you want to. So this is just saying that, okay, X decomposes into A union x minus a. Okay, so you have that statement right there. That's the first statement we did. But we just observed that um, we just observed that b is going to be less than a uh, a prime right here, and b is also less than x. So in particular, uh, b is going to be less than or equal to x meet a prime. Right? These are the things we just observed from before, and therefore. This statement applies to that one right there. If we make that statement there, I'll write it again. If B is less than or equal to X meet A prime, then we get that X meet A prime can be decomposed into the B part union the not B part. So we end up with X meet A prime meet B prime. I don't have to worry about parentheses in the last case because meet is an associative operation. Um, and so this right here can be substituted with this right here. So we get B, uh, B join A meet A prime meet B prime like so. And again, I don't need parentheses here because join is an associ associative operation in that situation. Um, for which then, 
we're going to reassociate this like so. Let me use a different color to emphasize that because uh, we have X meet A prime meet B prime. So if we reassociate there, you get X meet A prime meet B prime. But by De Morgan's law, A complement meet B complement is A join B complement. So making that substitution right here, we get our final statement. So that X with these two different atoms, X can be written as the A part plus the B part plus the not A B part. All right. And so by induction, we can continue this process for each atom, A1, A2, all the way up to AN. Each of those atoms belong um, to X. AI is less than or equal to X. And by similar reason as we had up here, um, AI does not belong to the A1, A2, A3, up to A minus one part. So by induction, we can continue this process. We end up with something like um, X, meet, and then you're gonna have a bunch of things, a join of all of these elements up to N, like so, and then we did not right there. So by induction, you can keep on doing this, all right? Uh, this is of course where the, this is, this is where finite makes things a lot easier. This process has to eventually terminate. For an infinite atomic Boolean algebra, that's actually part of the definition. I wasn't very explicit about the definition here because uh, this, after all, our focus is on the finite case. Uh, but for an atomic Boolean algebra, you do um, have the assumption that every element has finitely many um, atoms contained inside of it. Okay, uh, which again, I'm not gonna go through all of that. I, I don't wanna worry too much about infinite atomic Boolean algebra. Finite ones is gonna be sufficient for our purposes. So eventually this process is gonna have to terminate so that eventually there's no more atoms. And so this part basically becomes, um, this join is just going to die off with X. So this last part just vanishes off. So basically what I'm saying is by induction, we then get this decomposition into atoms, the so-called atomic factorization. And up to reordering, we claim that this thing is unique. That is, you don't have different atoms. You can't factor it one way with one atoms and factor it a different way with different atoms. And so let's look at that. Let's suppose we have two factorizations of the element X, where you have the, atom, the atomic factorization A1, join A2, join all the way up to AN. And then on the right, B1, join B2, all the way up to BM, like so. You have these two different factorizations. Well, if the second factorization doesn't involve A1, then look what happens when you take A, uh, well, I mean, A1, A2, AI, doesn't matter. We could, without the logic generally, assume it's A1, whatever, I'll still with AI since that's on the screen. If the second factorization didn't involve AI, right, then take the meat of AI with X. Well, since, uh, since that shows up in one of these things here by the distributive properties and all the other axioms of a Boolean algebra, you can argue that this thing is not gonna equal X, JK. It's gonna equal AI, okay? But when you consider the factorization on the right, you're gonna get AI meet all of these Bs. And so this is, let me show you the details that we did over here that I omitted them. You're gonna use the distributive law, so you distribute the AI, so you get AI meet B1, and then you're gonna get that a bunch of times, AI meet B2, AI meet B3, et cetera, all the way through BM. Right, and now since these are each atoms, none of those, well, most of those atoms, uh, they're different from AI, because uh, there's no repeats here. After all, it's idempotent. If there's any repeats, we can consolidate them together, <laughs> suck them together there. Um, so we can, if, if AI doesn't show up in this factorization, then each of these meets is gonna equal zero all the way through. And, and therefore, if you take zero, join zero, join zero, et cetera, you're just gonna end up with a zero. But in, conversely, if you do this with the A's, right, A-N, all of these things are gonna be zero, except there is an A-I that shows up, and so this simplifies just to be A-I. A-I, of course, is not equal to zero. Uh, we get a contradiction, and so that tells us that A-I is an atom that appears in this atomic factorization, and going through this, we then get a unique factorization. So Boolean algebras have unique factorization in the category of lattices, these, at these uh, unique atomic factorizations. So a Boolean algebra is kind of like a UFD with regard to lattice theory, which after all fields are UFDs too. So that matches up with our analog here. All right, so now we're in a position where we can define the isomorphism between B and the power set here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna map an element X to the set A1, A2, all the way up to AN. Remember, X here is the set of atoms of the Boolean algebra. 
And so this right here is a set of atoms where these atoms, A1, A2, up to An, these are the atoms that come from the atomic factorization of X. So if Ai is an atom of X, we put it inside the set. And so that's what we map to. This clearly is going to be a subset of X. So it is a map into the power set of X. We want to now show that it's homomorphic. Uh, let X and Y be two elements of the Boolean algebra, and suppose their atomic factorizations are the following. X can be factored into n many atoms, call them A1 through An. Y can be factored into m many atoms, call them B1 through Bm. And so then if we take the image of this map under the join of X and Y, this would then, well, if you take X with its, sub, its substitute, its factorization, do the same thing for Y, we get the following here. You're going to get X1 join A, excuse me, A1 join A2 all the way to AN join B1, B2, BM, like so. Um, for which this, as a, this, since this is a factorization of atoms, it'll map to the set A1, A2 up to AN, and B1, B2 up to BM, for which that set naturally can be decomposed into a union, for which you can put all the A's together in one set, the B's together in the second set. There could be repetition in these sets. I mean, there could be overlapping atoms between X and Y. That's not important in this. That, 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 that doesn't frustrate anything here. Um, clearly, this set... Um, is the image of X, because those are the atoms of X. And this set is the image of Y, because those are the atoms of Y. So we see that um, this map very naturally preserves the join operation. And that's mostly because we defined it using the atomic factorization, which comes from how to decompose an element using joins. Uh, the meet operation is going to be a little bit more challenging, because we have it that it's join uh, homomorphic. Why is it meet homomorphic? Well, we're going to do the same basic thing, although this one's going to be a little bit more convoluted, but we'll handle it just fine, no problem. Now, if you take phi of x meet y, well, we have the factorization for x, we have the factorization for y. Um, since our Boolean algebra is distributive, um, it's kind of like a FOIL type thing. Um, you have to do all the possible combinations. It's like the FOIL method, which is a consequence of the distributive property. So when you multiply this out, you're going to have a bunch of different, you're going to have a join of a bunch of meets. And those meets are going to look like some A meets some B, and you allow the indices I and J to run from 1 to N and 1 to M, respectfully, right? But these are atoms. These meets will either equal 0, for which inside of a join, a zero doesn't do anything, or it's equal to AI, right? I mean, and that would happen only if AI equals BJ. So whenever AI equals BJ, you retain the AI, but if they are distinct elements, their meet is zero, and the join, since it's the zero is the identity of join, it'll just vanish, and so you don't have them anymore. So this, this, uh, this sum, you know, this join simplifies down to be whenever we have a match, right? Um, for which then as a set, this is now this is now a, uh, a decomposition into atoms. It's an atomic factorization. And so that means this will map to the set where we grab all of the AIs that appear in the set. Well, AI appears inside that decomposition exactly when AI equals BJ for some I and some J, like so. All right, now this set, every set, can be decomposed into a union of uh, singletons, for which those singletons occur only when AI equals BJ, the same index set is in play here, for which these singletons can be represented as intersections of AI intersect BJ. Because if AI and BJ are the same element, the intersection of singletons will just be the singleton AI. But if BI excuse me, if AI and BJ are different elements, then their intersection will be uh, just an empty set. And if you throw an empty set into a union, it doesn't enlarge the union whatsoever. So these two unions are in fact the same thing, okay? For which intersections and unions are distributive. After all, it is a Boolean algebra. So we can factor this thing, uh, you know, reverse foil it into the following. We have a union of all of the A's, um, intersect the union of all the B's, which again, if you go backwards, if you foil this thing out by the distributive property, you get something like this. For which, if you take the union of all of these singletons of A's, that's just the set of A's. If you take similarly the union of all these singletons of B's, that's just the set of B's. And if we take the, uh, if we take, sorry, that's a typo right there. Uh, this should be an intersection symbol. 
because uh, it's the same symbol we had right there. Don't know why it turned into a union. Um, so then we get the set of A's, which that's the image of X, and we get the set of B's, which is the image of Y, um, intersected together. And so therefore, voila, we then turned our meet into an intersection, which is what we expect it to be. This then proves that phi is meet homomorphic. And as we already talked about complements, um, complements are preserved automatically by Boolean homomorphisms. So since we have a bijective Boolean homomorphism, this gives a Boolean isomorphism. So every atomic Boolean algebra is isomorphic to a uh, power set uh, with unions and intersections, uh, and which admittedly we didn't do the infinite atomic ones, I confess, we, we kind of talked about it. So if you don't want to be if you don't want to believe that, since we didn't apply the, apply the proof, just settle with the fact that every finite Boolean algebra is every finite Boolean algebra is in fact isomorphic to a power set, and as such, the order of this Boolean algebra is necessarily equal to two raised to well the number of atoms that are in the system. Oops, number of atoms, and that classifies all finite Boolean algebras.